everyone, it's Kirsten here. Welcome to another episode of Weekly Hope, our weekly uh, Um, it is a joy to have you here. If you're new and joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we're here every week, mostly on Wednesdays, around noon to bring you interviews with clinicians, experts in the field of mental health and eating disorders, uh, nonprofit leaders, advocates, people with their own recovery stories, just a whole host of different people to, to talk with, to get their insight, wisdom, hear their stories, um, and give you a chance to, to talk to them, ask your questions, share your stories as well. Um, that's what we are all about here at Weekly Hope, and I feel very, very honored and blessed to be able to host this show um, with my little furry co-host here. You can see this is Madam Elsa, and I know we've got lots of animal lovers out there. Um, so Elsa usually comes on with me and, and says hello and sits on my lap as I interview our very, very special guest. So she's here too. Um, but in, if you're joining us back, we've got lots of people who come back and watch the show every week. And so I want to say welcome to you as well. And you know what is so, so cool is that, you know, we've often got people that say hello. They pop in in the comments and, and share their name and where they're from. And we get people that watch the show from all over the world. So it's really, really special and, and means a lot to, to me and to our guests when you pop in there and, and tell us hi, tell us where you're signing in from. Um, and uh, it's just really amazing to see. Soon. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, but as I was just saying, it's just so nice to have this this global community of people supporting one another, um, listening and sharing their own stories, um, and inspiring each other. So that's that's what we are all about. And I'm hoping that today's show will also be one that is uplifting for you because we have a really really cool guest. Um, and I want to share too that this is a, a very special episode of Weekly Hope this week because this week is National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. And if you're not familiar with what that is, basically it is a very special week during the year where advocates, um, leaders, people who struggle with eating disorders, their families, um, clinicians, experts, all of us who really, really care about raising awareness of this issue, we get together this week, we share on social media, we we do videos and interviews like this. Um, we do speaking engagements. We just try to get the word out as much as possible about the reality and the seriousness of eating disorders as complex, life-threatening mental health issues, but also get the word out that there is hope, that recovery is possible, and that people do get better, and families do recover and beat this illness and go on to live happy, healthy, productive lives. Um, of course, many of you out there know my own recovery story, and I'm living proof of that, as is our guest. And there are so, so many people also who come in and tune into this show every week who are living, breathing examples of the hope that is available in recovery. So really, really cool week. And as a part of that, we wanted to get a really, really special guest. So without any further ado, I am going to bring him on to the other side of the screen. We are welcoming Mr. Mike Marjama to the show today. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And, and yeah, so everyone. Great message. Yeah. So where are you joining us from today? Uh, I'm in New York City. So I hope this connection stays OK. Um, I'm actually here um, in New York City. We've got a few things going on this week, which will be tremendous. Um, actually, right after this, I'm headed over and I'm doing some filming with the Jed Foundation for Jed Voices, which will be talks a lot about mental health in general and suicide prevention, which I'm very passionate about. And then uh, tomorrow we're doing some filming with MTV. And so I'm hosting a panel and uh, with MTV and MTV News. And we'll be talking about kind of the fashion industry, um, athletics and kind of bridging the gap between um, what I guess we think eating disorders are in mainstream media and then what actually um, they are. And so trying to bridge that gap for everybody. So, so cool. Um, so we are thrilled to, to hear your story and probably a lot of people out there in the eating disorder field have seen your name and have heard little bits of your story um, because when you made a big decision last year to leave Major League Baseball and to become an advocate 
for eating disorder um, awareness and recovery. You know, it was it was splashed everywhere. Um, and now you're doing this full time and you've got um, such passion for what you do. But maybe people don't know necessarily the details of your story. So why don't we just start out first by, you know, I'd love to hear from you. What was it? that made you leave this sport and this profession, which you loved and worked so many years to accomplish a very, very, you know, a, a really incredible position. And I mean, you were in the major leagues. What made you leave? Um, I think hopefully you can kind of relate to this in general, um, you know, kind of got this great platform. And um, I, I try to put it in, in terms for everybody. And I say, um, I want you to think about the car that you've always wanted, or a house, or maybe when you were younger, a toy, um, or or just any goal you've had. Well, I use the car reference because I think as we get older and you finally, you've wanted this car your entire life, and then finally you get that car, and then after like two or three days, you're like, oh, like, did you see that other car? Like, mm -hmm. I want that other car. And so the things that we feel like we want, um, I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I get this car. I'll be happy when I get this house. I'll be happy when I get a thousand followers. I'll be happy when I get 1500 followers, when I get 10,000 followers. And so we're always chasing something. And I think that that's where it was for me. It was I was always chasing this platform of you're going to be a major league baseball player. And then I get there and it was like, that didn't solve any of my problems. That didn't solve any of the underlying feelings that I had. And for me is when you're in major league baseball, you're always on a job interview. It's a job interview every single night. And I honestly didn't handle it very well. Um, I was definitely dealing with depression and anxiety because when you're at that level, if it, you could go, you could have great games. Um, but if someone didn't like the way you maybe received a ball as a catcher or anything like that, it was like you could be sent down. You could be let go. And mm -hmm. having that every single night and that pressure um, was definitely hard. Um, and so for me, it was my mom is a nurse practitioner, OBGYN. She goes, I would hate it as if I had 10, you know, if I had 50,000 people watching me give a pap smear. And if someone mm -hmm. didn't like it, right, I would yeah. like to let go. And so she goes, yeah. it's, it's that pressure. And so for me, it was, I've always had a passion around health and wellness. And then ever since about a year ago, I got to work with LeBron James and his digital media, media company, Uninterrupted. And we shot a documentary. It was like all these doors were opened up. And, uh, you know, it being able to air, you know, just about a year ago on the eve of opening day on Good Morning America. Right. And so this this outcry of people saying, hey, this is important. Um, it really kind of bridges this gap of I need to be doing this and I need to be sharing this message because um, I'm a man of faith. And I believe that I was granted a platform and God bless me with the platform. Um, maybe I wasn't meant to be a major league baseball player my entire life. I'm not a Mike Trout. I'm not a Bryce Harper. Um, but maybe God blessed me with this platform to be able to spread this message and and that, um, you know, and all this message of a positive movement going forward. So um, I'm incredibly blessed to have played there and kind of worked my butt off to get there. Um, but now it's about giving it back. Yeah. And, you know, you are very passionate, as you mentioned, about suicide prevention. You described some of your battles with depression and anxiety in the, in ma the major leagues. Um, one of the reasons, though, of course, that you're you're here and one of the reasons why so many people in the eating disorder field were so excited that you're talking out about this is because we have so few men um, who are who are using their voice and their public platform um, to talk about their battle with an eating disorder. Um, and I know that's just a part of the things that you struggled with, um, but for many people also, it's just a part of the many issues that they're dealing with. Um, so why, and you know, and also I have no idea as a guy what it's like to have an eating disorder because I'm not a guy. So can no, you give us a window? So I respect that. You know, um, <laughs> so can you give us a window? I know what it's like as a female. Can you give us a window into what your battle with an eating disorder was like from the male perspective? Yeah, so I, I really wanna start it off with, with saying this, that as men and women, we are far more similar than we are different. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I say it in this reference, we all have obstacles and we all have distresses in our lives. And so when I've shared my story, I get men that reach out, but I also get women that reach out. And I think that the, the message that needs to be shown is eating disorders and mental health in general are not reflections of solely body image. It's oftentimes reflection of personality traits, of maybe a perfectionism, obsessiveness, manipulation, those things of control. Um, a lot of times people feel out of control. So 
their body becomes a way of the only thing that they can control. Um, and so for me, it really started when I was young. And so I mean, people talk about why it's so important to have like a multifaceted team in recovery. It's largely because it's so complex. And so we're trying to put simple um, solutions or band-aids on a completely complex uh, problem. And so for me, it was like when I was young and I think back to my mom was like, when I was born, I was of total Scandinavian roots. So I'm like very Norwegian, very Finn. So my whole family, hey yeah, see, so it was like my brothers and sister, my brother and sister, blonde hair, blue eyed, very fair complexion. I came out hair everywhere, dark hair, like kind of darker skin. And I was the last baby in the nursery that anyone would have picked out to be Kim and Greg's son, right? And so my mom is like, honey, I promise you that's your son. Don't worry, <laughs> you know, but, like, okay. but that's, that's funny because that's, I didn't fit the mold of what I thought was acceptable for my family. And I think as I progressed and I got to like middle school and it was like, you know, the best time on the schoolyard was recess, of course, and everyone played tag. So uh, naturally I was going to tag the cutest girl on the schoolyard. And then in turn, she was going to tag me. Right. And it was going to be like a slow motion. Like she's going to reach out and like almost touch me. And then I'm like falling backwards matrix style. And then we like, uh -huh. She falls on top of me and we're like this far away from each other. And like the sun is going to break through the clouds and like Sarah McLaughlin's going to come on or so, you know, oh, wait, 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 just pause. So girls aren't the only ones who have like these idyllic fantasies of like how they're going to meet the one or whatever guys have those too. Well, yeah. We just apparently don't admit it, but like, yeah, like I love rom yeah. coms. I cried at the end of the notebook. Like it's, it's like, I'm, like, I'm totally vulnerable and I'm okay oh. with that. Granted, no, this That's is where amazing. I agree because therapy helps to help yes. me realize my true authentic self and be self-aware and be vulnerable. Um, the neighbor is awesome, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> but it's, for me, it was like that recess time. And then I never got tagged. And then I think about going to junior high school and it was like Abercrombie bags became big and there were these guys with their shirts off. And, and so where body image fell in for me was that I wasn't getting the attention and the and I had some underlying traumas from when I was young. And so this idea of acceptance and not being able to control that had led into the personality traits of perfectionism, mm -hmm. obsessiveness, control, and those shifting in to go, oh, people are getting attention because of their bodies. How can I accomplish that? And mm -hmm. so I think as we learn through diet culture, is we learn that if you if you're a man, if you want to get big and strong, you just work out a ton. And you're like, just go to the gym, go to the gym. And then if you and then when we learn through more of a diet culture side, we hear, well, just don't eat anything if you don't want to get fat. Mm. Or like, Stop eating. If you're, and so for me, it was like, OK, don't eat anything, work out a ton. And so this started snowballing and I got into wrestling. So I got cut from a basketball team, which was another thing that kind of brought a chip onto my shoulder. And I started snowballing and then I tried pretty much everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, started the exercise bulimia route, um, kind of went the anorexic route. Then I think what people can relate to here is that um, the fitness industry and what we've learned about this is, OK, just eat clean during the week. And then when the weekend comes, just have a cheat day. Well, what we're teaching people is we're teaching people the binge cycle is what we're teaching them. And we're mm -hmm. teaching them that you're going to restrict all week. The weekend comes, you're going to have a pizza party. OK, uh, I'm going to have a slice of pizza. And then pretty soon that one slice of pizza, you're so malnourished, like it has two, three, four, and then you feel guilty. So then that you're like, I'm going to do it better the next week. And we start cycling through and cycling through. And so for me, it's raising that awareness and going, look, we need to address this and we need to do it in healthy ways. Yeah. So, so what was the catalyst? So what was the catalyst that got you out of that cycle of abuse, basically? I mean, it's because it really isn't, you know, this is something that, um, you know, Jenny Schaefer talked about a lot in her book, Life Without Ed. but um, having my own experiences, I think it really is helpful to define the eating disorder as, as an abuser, um, as someone who abuses us and then is the part of us which allows it to abuse our body. So how did you get out of that cycle? What was the catalyst for you? Yeah. So I use it as like a way of numbing. So the way that many people of like say alcohol or cocaine, you know, or any sort of drug or any substance abuse is it almost becomes the numbing. And so for me, I use it as a numbing. So rather than dealing with my issues and my traits and the, the body dysmorphia that I had is I chose my eating disorder as my way of numbing. it. 
and and and, and by focusing and making the eating disorder the, the bad guy, I didn't have to address myself. Mm, and interesting. So, became, so I didn't have to really address what was going on inside of me. And so I didn't have to admit that I had a problem. I could blame it on my eating disorder. Mm. So for me, I had to kind of put it aside. Um, I went through treatment my junior year of high school. Um, so I started about seventh grade, get to my, and I cycled through for a long time. So in my junior year of high school, um, my mom made this big elaborate Thanksgiving dinner, and I just didn't partake in it. So she had me see a personal trainer, a counselor. I lost a significant amount of weight seeing this counselor. So they put me into inpatient and then um, go through my outpatient and, and um, um, go through the whole program. And I remember thinking at that time, like, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. But there were no other men talking about this type of issue. So I couldn't relate. And then I kind of went through their treatment and therapy and it was okay, but it wasn't until um, I got back into baseball and I went to a junior college and the first year, the coach said, you can come here, but you're not good enough to play. So we're gonna have to redshirt you, which means you just practice with the team and you don't play. Mm -hmm. um, and so he challenged me and he said, he handed me Victor Frankel's Man Search for Meaning. Oh, and I was like, why are you handing me this book about the Holocaust? This has nothing to do with baseball which I was like, if I get good at baseball, I can get chicks, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that was my solution. Um, mm -hmm. But he handed me this book and it was like, hey, between stimulus and response, there's a blank period and that's your freedom to choose and to grow. And he was like, look, your attitude is a decision. How you go about this is a decision, but it's gonna come basically down to you. So you're gonna need to confront yourself. And I was like, and it kind of hit me and, and was just like, look, mm -hmm. I'm not good enough at baseball to play. I've been pushing this stuff aside personally that's been causing me a lot of torment and trauma and it was like you know what you need to address this so as i kind of dove into that book i started realizing that i was very blessed and i was born into privilege and so i needed to take a look at myself deep down and say what makes you tick and the same things that i was learning through sports psychology with him also related to therapy and that was part mm -hmm. of the reason therapy maybe didn't work is I remember being the only guy in treatment and they were like, um, you know, so guys, if you, if you kind of are malnourished and you're not eating much and you're not getting nutritionally, you might lose your period. And I'm like, you're like, Oh wait, I don't have one to begin with. I don't really struggle with that. You know, and then as a guy, it's like, Hey, we want you to meditate or mm -hmm. have a mantra. Like you're speaking a foreign language to us when you're telling mm -hmm. that to a guy because we're told not to feel, not to be mindful. We're told to numb and just meet things with aggression. And so um, you know, it was hard for me. So I learned my treatment on a different field, which was the baseball field. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, we've got a question. Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, what book was that? Marissa wants to know, um, what book was that? Man's Search for Meaning. I'm gonna write it here. Um, Marissa for you by Viktor Frankl. I've read that book too. It's incredible. Um, for meaning. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. So we've got that. Um, and we've got a ton of people commenting here and sharing their own stories. And I just sure. want to say. Hey, one thing to put on there too, if you could. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't know if you've read uh, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -mm. Uh, my no. best friend, Vander Kolk, a tremendous book about trauma. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. It is it's mainly about trauma, but it talks about um, kind of his progression through, and it is fantastic on helping. If people are haven't been to therapy or are very skeptical about it, it kind of bridges the gap between common, um, kind of common sense or just common people and therapists. So it's a great avenue to kind of connect to, to be like, this is maybe why you're feeling this way. This is how your brain works. This is why it kind of navigates through. So I, I so cool. what is it? I'm putting it in the comments. It's called the yeah. body keeps the score. The body keeps the score. Like yeah, that's do you know the author? I have it right here. All right, so we're gonna wait for Mike to pop back on. Um, so stay with us because we have act two coming up and it's awesome. Um, so uh, I did just wanna say that I am Googling the body keeps the score um, so that we can get an author there. Um, so I can put this in there for you. Um, back. Van der Kolk. There you are. I'm back, sorry, I think that's me. I don't, we're gonna, we're gonna just play with this here. 
all good. No worries. Um, I was just looking up the author of The Body Keeps the Score, so I can put that in the comments so people can read. Amazing. I mean, um, I would recommend. Is it Bessel van der Kolk? Yes, that is. All right. By Bessel van der Kolk. Perfect. Um, that's awesome. And Sonia says, just says, Michael, I love your story. I can so relate. Love to this from a male perspective. Thank you so much. So it's another person who's super grateful for your story. Um, Megan Funkhauser agrees. Body keeps the score is fantastic. Thank you so much, Megan, for being here. Um, and Megan also says, I never thought of my eating disorder as an abuser. It seems very connected to recovery to think about it that way. Thinking um, that way seems very shame releasing. And yeah, it was for me. Um, but then it's interesting too to hear Mike's perspective about the fact that it was really important to not disconnect too much from the eating disorder because then he could release responsibility for it. So it's just, I think, another <sighs> emphasis to me that the way that everyone works through their recovery process is so different, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that not one way works for everyone. Um, no, and I think we need to address the fact that like in distress tolerance, right? Like, yeah. so I'm huge in talking about this idea of toxic masculinity is going around right now. And yeah. This idea that, that men are this, that are bad. And I, and I think there are very much so that that is prevalent, but there are also men that are doing some great, great things. And so what I wanted to point out to people is that also in this, with your eating disorder in, in kind of that connection is that we need to be tolerant of our own distresses. So we need to, and that's why medication can oftentimes help is because sometimes we get so worked up that we can't kind of touch that underlying trauma or things that are going on inside of us. So the medication can help with that. Now the medication isn't the end all be all solution, but we need to be able to tolerate our own distresses, the things that are hurting us. And we need to be vulnerable for that. But we also need to feel that in others too. I don't know what it's like to be, like I said, I don't know what it's like to be a woman. I don't know what it's like to have a period. I don't, but I can definitely empathize and go, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to have to give birth. And so I can, like, to be honest, but like, at least I need to be able to say, you know what? I can, I may not understand what that, that's like, but I can respect that. And I can appreciate that, that you have struggles as well whether it be emotionally, physically, spiritually, I know that you have those and I can respect those. And I think by doing so, we become very, we, in, we give grace and we give um, this, this mutual respect. And I think that's where, if you wanna talk politically, you wanna talk mass, whatever you wanna talk about is knowing that we all have problems and that's okay, but let's talk about it in terms of a mutual respect rather than trying to just put on this understanding. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of relates to what you we started to talk about with body body positivity. And while that is a wonderful thing to strive for and body image is a part of the conversation related to eating disorders, it's not everything. And um, that's why, too, I think we do get so divided. And I actually think maybe thinking out loud here that perhaps it's one of the things that has been a barrier for men to get the care that they need because when eating disorders are so associated with weight loss, the drive to be thin, um, sexual attractiveness, uh, it very much does seem like a woman's disease. But it's really, yes, the relationship with the body is a part of it, but it's those underlying emotional issues. And that's what we also want to use things like Eating Disorders Awareness Week to make sure that people know that this is not just about girls wanting to look like models or boys wanting to look like like Abercrombie models. This is deeper underlying emotional issues and traumas um, that are manifesting themselves. And it's another reason why so many people who struggle with eating disorders then go on to struggle with other things, substance abuse, um, depression, self-harm, suicide. Um, you know, what was it for you? What was the underlying issue for you that you discovered in your recovery? So there were there were a few. <laughs> there were there were a few. Um, there are always right, and we're yeah. discovering more every day, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. The traits were there. Um, if I look at the perfectionism of, of trying to perfect myself, that was number one. And and it's because it's not just about that. Wasn't just related to my eating disorder. Um, I use the example of when I go out to dinner and especially go with my mom. And the reason I talk about my, me and my mom have a great relationship. Um, but when I have my eating disorder, we butted heads and we're both very, we're both cut from the same cloth. Like we, I, I am her son. And 
Uh, so we got to dinner and I'm very obsessive about things and I control everything. And I think people can understand this is I would put my, uh, on my plate, my knife and my fork have to run parallel to the plate and they both have to be straight. And so they'll be just right up there. Well, my mom would be like, hey, did you get the waiter? And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, hey, can you? And then she'll move my knife to where it just turns a little bit. And so when I look back, I'm like, and so I have to turn it, straighten it out. And then she'll again, move it and straight. And so I think kind of a lot of people that are very obsessive or, or controlling of their environments can kind of relate to that idea. And those are the underlying things that were there for me. So I've had to learn how to take a deep breath, realize the importance of that knife being straight and deal with that. And so those are the things that, that are my underlying thing. And sure, they're traumatic events. I remember getting dated for a lunch period because a girl felt bad for me. Um, you know, I remember certain little glimpses. Um, you know, people ask me, um, you know, I don't remember games, baseball games, honestly. But I remember things that happened when I was a child or when I was younger, um, not personally sex, sexually abused or really um, anything like that. Um, but I definitely had verbal abuse from kids at school and I got bullied. And so those were some traumatic experiences that played that I never resolved. But I internalized those and said, I must be the person at fault. And so mm -hmm. I had to work through those and I had to um, forgive the people that abused me. But I also had to forgive myself for taking me down the road that I went. Yeah. So that's a, um, and someone else mentioned in the comments about the eating disorder becoming their identity. Am I frozen? Um, yep. And you talked about self-worth. Um, and for me, a huge thing was I didn't feel a sense of self-worth. And the eating disorder gave me a feeling of self-worth. Um, and then I discovered that it was a liar and that it kept promising me it was going to give me that, but it never did. It only made me feel self-hatred and shame. Um, where does your sense of self-worth come from now? It comes from uh, my daily gratitude list. And my self-worth comes from my daily gratitude list because when I was going through it, someone offered, they said, hey, why don't you start a daily gratitude list? And I was like, no way am I doing this. Like, this is the most stupid thing. So I tried and I couldn't find anything that I was grateful for. And I am very privileged. Throughout my whole life, I've been very privileged, but I couldn't find anything worth being grateful for. And now I could fill up pages of it. And that's where my self-worth comes in is I look at it and go, you know what, I'm able, I have all these, and not I have them in, in terms of something that's a tangible thing. Um, it's I have the, the respect, I have the confidence in myself. I have, I have all these layers of what I'm grateful for, whether it be my family, whether it be being able to do this, impacting more people. That is where I find my confidence and my self-worth because I know that it's been earned by what I've given. And mm -hmm. so I think what people, what I start to tell people is your confidence is earned. You don't just, you don't just wake up and have confidence. That's not how this works. But I'm confident because I had to work through the lack of, I had to work through the, the grind. I had to work through the struggle and I'm still here. And I've gotten to the point I'm at today. That's where I gain my confidence. I've earned it by doing my treatment, by doing my therapy. And so for all the people that are like, you know what? I don't know if I'm happy with myself. I'm not confident. And I say, go earn it. Earn it by what you do and what you say. And when you start, and the best way to do that is to give. So I use the analogy of Christmas morning. Okay. You're about to give somebody a gift and they, you know, when they pick it up and it's your gift, you start getting goosebumps. You're like, oh, they're going to open my gift. They're going to open my gift. And then they open it up and they love it. And then that feeling rushes over you and you get goosebumps and you feel so freaking good. Okay. Why don't we do that every day? Why don't we give something every day? Because when you give, you get so much in return. So when you want to see where your confidence or self-worth comes from, do that. Give and then watch how it kind of comes back to you. If you have a dollar, go, go get a coffee for somebody. Just go pick up their coffee and watch how their face lights up. Like those are the little things that I think you can find some growing periods and that's how you earn it. Yeah. Oh, Mike, I wish we lived in a world where coffee was a dollar. <laughs> that is true. Goodness. It's not like that in New York. No, sir. But yes, I completely agree with you. I don't know, um, how, I don't know how people can pay rent here. I got a coffee yesterday. It was like six bucks. Uh, yeah. In New York is, and I, and yeah, that's one of the reasons why I left. It was so expensive. That's not the main reason, but 
that was how my underlying decision manifested itself. It's too expensive here. <laughs> um, we've got a really great question from Chris. She says, Mike, have you ever come across someone who didn't believe you had an eating disorder that you could just snap out of it? If so, how did you process this and respond to them? Yeah, I definitely have people that that will say like, hey, oh, well, you didn't you didn't have an eating disorder um, until they saw my treatment team on center court of the Sacramento Kings game talking about my treatment. So mm -hmm. that kind of debunked that myth. Um, but um, I, I didn't. And, and um, I think we hear this with eating disorder people as they say, well, just um, just eat more. Just eat something. And we start becoming as the food isn't the underlying problem. Your body isn't the isn't the problem. It is more or less kind of your um, the way that you're coping with it for that underlying issue. So for me to respond to them is it's not something you just snap out of. And I said that's why there's a multifaceted team. And unfortunately, what I'm trying to do, and like yourself and many others, is educate people that this isn't something you just snap out of. Right? You wouldn't you wouldn't um, ask. Uh, somebody to just go boom you're all better um, we we can't give that and I think that that's where American culture has come to specifically is we expect you to have in modern medicine is here's a pill it's fixed here's a pill it's fixed or here's this it's fixed and it doesn't work like that and I, we know that with mental health specifically so um, you know, for me yes I've had people that don't believe me or that say just snap out of it and and I try to politely say these are the steps that I had to go through um, and normally it's people that haven't had a chance to go to therapy. And I think, um, you know, it's like when you do a, when you do an intake with a therapist, it takes you a few times to get to know each other and open up and start to feel that connection. And I tell this people all the time, if you go see one therapist and it's not right, don't give up on therapy. Yeah. Do not please. Because sometimes it's like, there's a reason that th it's like dating. Like the first person that you meet may not be your soulmate and that's okay you have to have that connection built yeah absolutely um so mike i want to touch base with you because you as an elite athlete um you know you have experiences with and have had with coaches with trainers and um people in that world what advice would you give to parents who are dealing with their son or daughter's coach or trainer um you know and trying to have some of those difficult conversations about healthy body image about eating disorders about you know because it's so it's so hard it's an elite world because so that the coach or the trainer wants to help the the athlete or the dancer or whatever push past pain you know push past their comfort zone all this but it can be really really hard for someone if they're in recovery from an eating disorder what advice would you give parents and how to talk about these issues with coaches or trainers yeah so i still have this issue to this day um you know i have a little sister who plays volleyball in college and her coach calls her fat a lot and and that to me is like oh goodness here we go like we we are we as a community and, and part of the reason i'm doing a lot of what i'm doing is to help enlighten the athletic community on that so as athletes you're expected to be the peak performers so you're expected to go beyond and we're kind of taught like um, pain is weakness leaving the body or um, if it doesn't hurt it doesn't get you better and so we talk to ourselves and i didn't know this until i talked to someone just a while ago he goes i actually talk to myself like a coach and i was like I do that all the time. And so it's like, I, 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 and I lost, I talked to myself like the worst coach ever because that's what the voice is. And so I tell people all the time when I went to major league stadium, fans yelling at me didn't bother me because I had already told myself worse things than anybody's ever going to tell me. Yeah. So like, I don't care if someone said anything because I'm my own worst critic. And I think many people can relate to that. So, what I would say is to someone struggling is you're going to talk to yourself like a coach, most likely. And when you do so, think of the coaches that build you up versus tear you down. Think of the Dabo Sweeney's versus <laughs> your yellers. Think of the people that are, are here to build you and to encourage you and motivate you. And there was a cool study done. Eric Barker did this in Barking Up the Wrong Tree, reading his book is out of Navy SEALs. Um, they did a study. And they wanted to know what was the common thread of Navy SEALs that passed Bud's training. And out of all things, it was optimistic or positive self-talk. Mm. That was the common thread of Navy SEALs. Went, so like all my uber masculine guys out there, like mindfulness and talking to yourself kindly is not a bad thing. That's what is actually the beneficial to 
badass Navy SEALs being badass Navy SEALs. So you can enlighten yourself and encourage yourself that way. And that's what we're trying to tell coaches is, look, if you want to increase performance, it has to be done through a positive and optimistic talk. Not only talk through your coaching, but for players to build that optimistic and positive self-talk. Yeah, it's it's so important. You're so right. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering, too, if you've got um, – so we we do have a lot of parents that watch this, watch this show as well um, and comment here about their their children that are struggling this. What advice would you give to parents on what the, you said you had a really close relationship with your mom and that during that time in your recovery that you butted heads um, as I did with my mom. Um, but now we also have a great relationship. What advice would you give parents on how best to support their son or daughter as they're going through this? So I think one of the great things to do is have different avenues that aren't um, my documentary with uninterrupted tends to be a great bridge because it doesn't specifically say, hey, you have an eating disorder. We need you need to go get help. It literally says, oh, wow. Hey, there's this kind of cool guy, maybe that he was talking about something and I saw this video and it's really well done. So then you don't have to address it entirely because we become defensive. Right. So when someone in this it's human nature, when someone addresses it, comes up to you and says, hey, you have a problem, you need to get help you automatically go defensive and you shut off and you just push away. And so as parents, sometimes we have the best intentions. I'm not a parent, so I can't relate to this, but I can speak from my mother's experience is and my father's experience is you can't just go in and say, Hey, you have a problem. You need help because as a, as a person struggling, we just turn off. And so, and we, then we don't want to come to you. So I think you can't lead a horse to or you can lead a horse to water. You can't make a drink. Right. So yeah. um, that's, that's an important step for my older people. Um, for my people that are, you know, maybe a, a above 18 years old is is um, continually providing, hey, if you need anything, I'm here. If you need anything, I'm here. If you need anything, I'm here. But part of the reason I was hospitalized is I was 16, almost 17, about 17 years old. Yeah. And my all of my mom's coworkers were basically saying, you need to put him in treatment now before he turns 18. Mm. Yeah. And so it was forced upon me. Now, did I like it? No, but it ended up saving my life. So for all my parents that are, you have a child that's nearing 18, I'm very much, and, and that's where for me, I'm very into the early intervention and prevention is getting, because as yeah. we know, when this, when this progresses too, it also becomes a problem. So, you know, I would say is initially the first steps are to not directly address it is to try to find a way to kind of circumnavigate to where it's not so threatening. You say, oh, so hopefully they can relate to a character, maybe like myself. And that's why advocates and people telling, telling their stories are so important is to give someone to relate to. And then when they say that's not your parent because you're supposed to say that or therapist because you're supposed to say that, you're now allowing them a different avenue to do that. So I'd say that's the first step. If you're under 18, it's not working. You need to get them to treatment. Um, and then if you are over, I think you need to continually offer help or continually offer to be there for them because there's going to be one day where they're sick and tired of being sick and tired like I was and they're going to ask for help and that's when you can be there. Yeah, no, such, such wise words and thank you so much for sharing that. I know that will be super helpful and I know there's also some people that are watching who um, are probably have sons who are like, oh gosh, I wish my son was watching this and hearing from this guy. Um, so I just want to encourage you if you're a parent and watching and, um, and your son or, or a young man in your life that you know would just, just gosh, treasure and cherish all these words from Mike. Um, please share this video um, when we're done. Um, all right. So we're wrapping up here. Um, what is next for you? Because I know you've got all these grand projects that you're working on, probably some that you can tell us about, some that you can't. Um, but what is in the plan for Mike moving forward? Well, too many things. <laughs> um, everyone likes to say, but I'm a nonstop go. I'm, I'm considered like the energizer bunny. So I like to think of myself as I just go, 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 go. Um, so coming up here today, like I said, we're working with the Jed Foundation. So we're doing a, a Jed Voices piece, um, which talking about suicide prevention, but more importantly, mental health and this eating disorder awareness week, um, doing some filming for MTV. Um, so I'm going to continue to be a voice for everybody, um, working on some continuing education stuff to, um, to further um, my knowledge, especially in this field, but continue to inspire young men, women, um, you know, men, women, young and old um, to really have the services that they need. And so a lot of that's going to be through legislative action as well, because we know insurances don't cover a lot of the stuff. Um, and so that's going to be another step um, in the right direction, hopefully for us. Um, and shoot, why not? I want to run for president. Ooh, why not? 
<laughs> okay, well. We, uh, you heard we got, it here first, breaking news. We've got people announcing all over the place that they're running for president. So you just joined the- I'm 35 though, so I've got a few years. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, you have to be 35. Yeah, so I got six years to kind of work through this stuff. But you heard it here first, announcement six years from now, I'm on that, or whenever the date comes up, I'm on that card. One day, uh, Mike Marjama is running for president. You heard it here first. Um, so cool. Um, oh, we've got a question from Priya. She says, what's the documentary called? Did you mention a documentary? Oh, and yeah, can we get that term? It's called Marge, just M-A-R-J. That's like my nickname that everyone's called me. Um, and so it's on, uh, you can go on YouTube. It's on, uh, it's on YouTube. You can just type in Marjama. You can type in my name or just type in Mike Marjama. Um, and you can find it on YouTube. Um, you can also find it on uninterrupted, which is, um, LeBron James's digital media company. Um, they do a lot of good work with athletes and the message, um, and their brand is, is talking about being more than an athlete and talking about how you have a platform that can be used um, for really good things. So, um, I highly recommend if you can go watch it, I would do that. Cool. I actually just found it on YouTube. So Priya, thanks for asking that great question. I put it in the comment section. Um, I found it on uh, uninterrupted. So that's really, really great. So you can hear more about Mike's stuff. Awesome. Um, cool. Uh, let's see if we've got any other questions. Thank you guys so much. You've been so amazing in the comments. And I see you supporting each other and cheering each other on. And I just want to say that's incredible. And thank you so much for being this support system also for the people that are watching this. It's really, really incredible. Um, Priya says, thank you. So, um, all right, Mike, last question. And I, um, I ask this to everyone who comes on our show. If we've got people who are currently struggling right now, um, male, female, as you said so brilliantly at the very beginning of this, we're so much more alike than we are different. So we can all glean wisdom from you um, wherever they are in their stage of their recovery journey. But if they're watching this and they're struggling and you could give them some words of wisdom, what would those be? It's okay. It's okay to be struggling because we all do. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that bleeds neon green. I've never met a Hulk. We all bleed red. We all bleed red, no matter your age, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. I don't care who you are. We are no one is immune to having to obstacles and, and problems in their life or, or struggles. We all have. And I think the biggest thing we can do is say that it's OK. It's OK to have these problems because we all do every day. But I think it's time to choose your inner in frozen, choose your Queen Elsa that unfreezes everything versus the Queen Elsa that freezes everything. You have the same power. Her power never changes. Her power is always the same. If you choose the darkness, if you choose that villain, if you feel like that, that's the road you're going down and you freeze everything, you know what, then we do that sometimes. But try to find that inner Elsa that allows you to choose that healthy way, that healthy, that healthy coping skills, um, those healthy decisions. So I always, I always tell people, choose your inner superhero. It's okay to have problems. Choose your inner superhero. Try to find your strength there because you are far stronger than you think you are. And I can promise you that because if someone like me could get to the point where I got to after my eating disorder, I promise you, you can too. Amazing. Mike, you are such an inspiration. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I know you are busy and you've got a ton on your plate this week, but we, all of us here in the field are so thankful for your voice. We're so thankful that you are, have chosen to, to do this and to share your heart with others. It's, um, it really is a blessing to so many and we hope that you, um, continue to do this and, uh, just, you had that gratitude list and I say that you should go on all of our gratitude lists because you are making a truly, truly massive impact and just want to say thank you so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. All right. Well, stay by Mike. And, um, I know that I'm frozen right now and I'm so sorry, but, um, just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. This was 
probably by far my favorite episode so far. It's just, it's so, so nice um, to be able to have someone from a different perspective come on and uh, and talk to us. So I uh, hope that this was wonderful for you as well. We've got, um, we're gonna be having this episode pinned to the top of our Facebook page for the rest of the week. So if you wanna send someone over to the Eating Disorder Hope Facebook page, if they missed it, um, tell them to come on over here so they can watch. Also, within the next day or two, we're gonna have this video posted on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you head over to YouTube, hit subscribe, to the Eating Disorder Hope YouTube channel. And of course, um, there you can send the link of Mike's video to anyone and everyone who might need it. So thank you so much. Happy need, um, National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. And um, just wherever you are and wherever you might be right now, just take those words that Mike shared to heart and, um, and find your inner Elsa. We like Elsas around here. My Elsa is somewhere sleeping, but you find yours. All right. We'll see you next week for another episode of Weekly Hope. I'm Kirsten. It was great to have you here and we'll see you next time. All right. Ciao.